city again and uh, so at any rate I, uh, I did that and um, because my background is architecture I tend to be uh, one who connects the dots because when you put a building together you get a, you uh, create a program and you have all these loose parameters and you have to kind of like a puzzle put them together into some sort of mini meaningful relationship and from that comes the building and we were always taught never predetermine the, the outcome of the building the shape the whole thing let it grow from the parameters uh, of, the, uh, of the program. So uh, that sort of stayed with me. And uh, long about the uh, 90s, early 90s, uh, I was not political at all. I was involved in, I'd since gone off into real estate, and doing home loans, and still staying in architecture and doing several things. But at any rate, I, uh, I, got in, I heard Ross Perot's giant sucking sound of jobs going to Mexico. And that's, for some reason, that stuck with me. And I really pursued that and uh, ultimately joined Pro's organization. And, uh, and then I asked the question of uh, the manager at that time or the uh, uh, director of the organization. I said, who's working on the NAFTA issue? And uh, basically told me that no one was. That it had not been formulated into any kind of official group. And then he offered, but if you want to take charge of it. Hey, we need all the people we can get. Go ahead. So I kind of put my foot in my mouth and thought, well, okay, I better do something. So I started, and what I, what I ultimately ended up doing was organizing. At that time, we were in California, and I organized the state of California in a fax tree effort of communication. And uh, eventually that went nationwide. And ultimately, I ended up linking up with Ralph Nader's organization, Citizen Trade Campaign. So we had pro people on the one hand, and we had native people on the other, all focused on the idea of losing jobs, primarily to Mexico at the time. Uh, I'm going to leave that for a minute and just basically say that what I do now is I spend a whole lot of time researching candidates and bills that come up. And uh, we're caught up in this mode right now where people hear sound bites two nights ago and they base their vote on what somebody said a week or two ago, uh, go to the polls with that. And uh, in the last campaign, 2008, I was looking at the two candidates, and what I found out was the advisors to Obama and McCain were related, essentially. McCain's advisor was Henry Kissinger, Obama's advisor. One of them was Zig, Zig Brzezinski. And uh, Brzezinski was a founding uh, member of the Trilateral Commission with David Rockefeller. And Kissinger is also a protege of Rockefeller. <coughs> Kissinger was involved in Nixon when they started the, the, uh, this, uh, the communication with uh, Communist China, detente, they called it. So uh, anyhow, getting back to these trade issues, I couldn't understand why all of a sudden from nowhere came this idea that we have to do trade with Mexico and Canada. It was a big thing. And people were mostly against it because they really didn't see the sense in it, but it didn't seem to matter to the media or to the politicians themselves. So uh, the vote went on, and uh, as much as we tried to inform, we, I went to Washington with others, and we tried to uh, convince the congressman that this was not going to be beneficial to us because wages down there were so low, and, uh, but we seemed to get nowhere, and uh, ultimately it, it passed. Interesting, interesting thing about that, and I'm trying to be quick here, and I've got a lot of information to tell you, but was that... Uh, Bill Clinton was, of course, president at the time, and that was in the first term. He had a majority in the House and in the Senate, Democrat, 
majority House and Senate. And uh, still in all, he managed to get key Republicans to vote for the uh, NAFTA agreement. In fact, the Republican vote on NAFTA, and I have these numbers here, I want to make sure I get them right, uh, was 132 Republicans, 102 Democrats. So in a, in a majority Democratic House, there were more Republicans that voted for NAFTA than, than Democrats. After NAFTA passed in 94, the next thing that came up, and uh, I have to credit Citizen Trade for bringing it up, was the whole GATT issue, GATT World Trade Organization. And they saw GATT as, as uh, basically neutralizing a lot of our laws that were, uh, you know, food safety laws and uh, workers' rights laws and that sort of thing. And um, I couldn't see the idea of transferring our trade authority to a bureaucracy in, uh, in Geneva, Switzerland. So uh, I was opposed to that as well. And uh, how that worked is, you remember Newt Gingrich started the, uh, the uh, movement to uh, bring Republicans uh, into the House and Senate to contract with America. And um, that would bear, bear fruit or came to fruition in November of 94. So early November of 94, that vote put a lot of Republicans into office to the extent that they would take the whole House and the whole Senate. And what we were amazed to find out, and Gat had been brewing all this time, the vote, at first it was in July, it was being postponed, 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 because they didn't want to have the vote till they had the numbers. That's the way these things work. They don't have a vote till they know they've got enough on their side to pass it. They don't want to take that chance of having uh, a, a negative vote or, or having the issue voted down. So anyhow, um, in the 29th of November, after the election, after the Republicans had won both House and Senate, they called a lame duck session, kind of like what you're hearing about this year. And they had a vote on the gap. Now, Newt Gingrich had just told the American people that we need to take over government and we need to do it right, and if you'll give me your confidence and the Republicans your vote, we will do it. Well, that was on at the early part of November, maybe around the 4th. I don't know exactly, exactly what the vote date was, but I'm sure it was somewhere around the 4th of November. On the 29th, they called them back, and Newt Gingrich and John Boehner, who had just come into office in 1990, both voted for the World Trade Organization. But they weren't alone, because Nancy Pelosi had come in in 87, 1987, and like NAFTA, Gingrich, Boehner, and Pelosi voted for NAFTA. And when it came to the World Trade Organization, Gingrich, Boehner, and Pelosi uh, found common ground there, too. And uh, for anybody that's interested, I have right here the votes on those, all these issues that I'm talking about. I also have them posted on my website. So they can verify it themselves that these people, in fact, did vote the way they, and I'm telling you. Um, going on from there, the Republicans took the House and the Senate and uh, under Clinton, and the second half of Clinton's term was a Republican-dominated uh, Congress. Um, it went, there were there, uh, several things came up. One was a, a Glass-Steagall, repeal of Glass-Steagall, which came up uh, early in uh, 1999, I think it was. Um, yes, November of 99. Anyway, that was, that was uh, passed, and what they ultimately did was they gave the banks the right to uh, merge with investment houses and insurance companies, and they basically created the two big fails. Uh, that was, again, uh, a Republican-led issue because they now had the House and Senate, and the vote was 207 uh, Republicans in favor and 155 Democrats in favor. Uh, after that came free trade for, and I'm going to say, communist China. Uh, that whole idea came out of nowhere again. We talk about this health care bill and why all of a sudden does government have to control our lives and want to do our health care, pass it down, you know, against the will of the people and essentially down our throats, people are saying. And, well, the same thing was happening in the 90s, except it was all trade. It was all global, globalism coming on the scene and people kept saying, well, you can't stop the train of globalism. It's inevitable. It's coming. You can't turn it back. And so uh, the, the uh, PMTR, they call it Permanent Normal Trade Relations with Communist China, came up because up until then we've been doing a year-by-year -year analysis depending on the human rights situation. And then you all remember Tiananmen Square uh, in 1989 where you know, the students were calling for uh, democratic reforms in the Communist Party and they got essentially run out of the square with tanks and a lot of fire. Um, 
any rate, by the year 2000, they were still reviewing it. And there was a lot of discussion about the fact that China was still very much top-down dictatorial uh, human rights violator. Nevertheless, Republicans were in control, and they felt compelled that somehow we had to establish trade with communist China. So uh, the uh, bill was drawn up by a senator, I mean a representative from Texas, Bill Archer, Republican and brought to the floor of the uh, House. And uh, the people in charge were David Dreyer, who was Republican out of California, and Roy Blunt, Republican out of Missouri. And uh, Roy was the deputy uh, whip of the, of the House Democrats. Well, it went up for a discussion and for vote, and uh, people that were opposing it, interesting enough, were Dana Rohrabacher out of California, who was very outspoken on <coughs> Compion Ramos uh, situation, if you remember that, the border agents. And, uh, and the other person was Ron Paul. Ron Paul made a statement that uh, basically the greatest human rights violator is communist China. Why would we be, be wanting to do a trade break? Yeah. That didn't stop anything. The vote went through, and the final outcome of the vote was 164 Republicans in favor, 73 Democrats in favor. 164 Republicans, 70 percent of the positive vote that passed free trade with communist China was a Republican God and country party vote. And I really want to get that out there because until we get into this kind of thing and start studying what is what really went on and what's really happening in our government, they can tell us anything. They can tell us they're going to bring jobs back. John Boehner's out there talking about bringing jobs back and we're going to create this and we're going to create that. They can't create anything because we're set up right now that anything novel that comes on the scene gets transferred to China and the technology that came along with it. That's how things are working now. Um, that vote went down. Of course, uh, Blunt voted for it, and so did Boehner. And, uh, and so did Bond, and so did Danforth. And Bond and Danforth, Bond especially now, has key votes for most of these trade agreements. But they voted for free trade with communist China. We don't talk to uh, Cuba. That's off limits communism. And Venezuela is even worse. Fox News is always telling you how bad Venezuela is. But somehow the communists in China are good enough that we can trade with. And the communists in China, to this day, are still persecuting Christians. They're still forcing abortions on people who have more than one child. And there's word, there's not definition, but there uh, or substantiation yet, but there's a lot of word that they're harvesting body, body parts from prisoners, Tibetans and uh, Kal uh, Falun Gong people. And uh, this communist China is exactly the opposite polar end <coughs> of ideology from the United States. We are the land of the free, home of the brave, home of individual rights. Our constitution is all about individual rights, government. Uh, is our servant. We are the we are the government. In communist China, it's a one-party system, just the opposite. People have no rights, no freedom recognized. If they, you know, they have a freedom to choose their ketchup, but they had better not speak out against government. How did we? How did our Congress decide that we, the United States, should link up with communist China to the extent now that it isn't 40 percent or 50 percent communist Chinese in our stores? It's 90 or 95 percent. And we buy that material from them. And I don't know what your personal situations are as far as life goes. I'm 100% pro-life, uh, even in the case of rape and incest. That's our party position. And the reason for that is we believe strongly in the uh, right to life, liberty, and happiness, and in the Creator who gave us our rights. And our rights are so precious that no man can take them from us. So we believe strongly in the right to life. And if we believe that creator created life, then how can we at some point say, but another life is mine to, to decide on? And that somehow the creator in his ultimate wisdom must have made a mistake. 